Yeah, we're back to a uh, research session. So the presenters today is going to be uh, now is going to be Danny Kodicek and Thomas uh, Turner. Uh, Dan is the director of the Codstar Lab at UPenn and uh, Thomas is uh, Dan's PhD student. So today they're going to be talking about uh, reactive behaviors for legged robots. Um, Dan or, or Thomas, the floor is yours. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get started and then I'll get out of Turner's way in uh, just a few minutes. Uh, so, uh, you know, thanks. So can you guys uh, hear me? Perfectly. And you can see the projection screen. Everything's great. great. Okay, so you know, um, it's I'm very, we're very grateful to the organizers uh, for inviting us to this wonderful uh, workshop. It's clear that uh, things are very exciting right now. It's it's wonderful to see uh, the success of the the growing success of the companies, and it really does raise the question of what's the role of academia. It reminds me of the '80s when I watched what happened to uh, the computer engineers. Um, you know, our view is that we should be trying to work on, on the fundamental problems. And uh, Jesse articulated very well this morning, I think, that complexity itself is very important. And our focus is on uh, compositional methods uh, that have provable properties. Uh, so um, just uh, going uh, back a little bit in time, uh, Martin Bueller uh, and I were very inspired by Mark Redford's uh, hopping work in the 80s. And Martin was able to uh, formalize the long-standing dynamical systems tradition what, of what Bob Full, biologist, eventually called templates and anchors, which is attracting invariant sub-manifolds as a way of doing hierarchical composition. So we've been doing hierarchical composition for decades. Here's Bill Schwinn's work where you've got a white pogo stick anchoring the red high degree of freedom hopper, different postures, but the same anchoring. Uh, Martin came back with Ulrich Spironi and Bill a Rex, which empirically anchors the same thing as Mark's uh, pogo sticks. Uh, but we didn't have, uh, these were all ad hoc uh, methods of uh, anchoring templates until recently, uh, Avik Day's thesis five years ago, Avik really break, broke through this by showing how to do a formal parallel proposition, um, formalizing the kinds of things that Mark had been doing for years. Uh, but now uh, being able to move into uh, various bodies, having the same uh, template be anchored by very, very different bodies with different compositions. And so these parallel compositions are a prime means of achieving these hierarchical compositions with formal properties. I would say the next uh, big thing that's coming out of our work is uh, Turner's work that I'm gonna get out of the way uh, as soon as I can. Uh, Turner started out by sequencing transitions of these various parallel compositions, you know, jumping up to open doors and that kind of thing, or uh, taking instead of a steady state view of bounding up the stairs, taking uh, a, uh, um, a transitional view of bounding up the stairs. But in the last uh, few years, as I'll get out of the way and let him show you, he's been able to take the notion of sequential composition, which is also formal, and begin to figure out how to get the attractor basins of parallel things, it translated into the language that the underlying template understands or begins to understand in a reactive manner. So before I, okay, so the whole, the whole point is, can, can we use these formal compositional methods to do more than just steady state things? Can we use them to be reactive in the physical uncertain world? Um, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about before I get out of uh, Turner's way is to remind people of Aaron Johnson's work. Aaron Johnson uh, uh, was a doctoral student in our lab about six, uh, eight years ago now. He's a professor at CMU. And Aaron uh, pioneered this very, very abstracted representation of the environment. If you think about the sagittal plane view of the environment, polyhedral, then what Aaron did was he uh, reasoned about the points of contact of a body on the substrate. So the body could have no points of contact, zero, 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 zero. The body could have a leg contacting in the front, zero, one, zero, zero, or a leg contacting in back, zero, zero, one. Or you could have your nose on the ground and no legs or the butt on the ground. You could So uh, there's this uh, very nice uh, simplicial complex that you build up from these abstract representations of the environmental contact. And Aaron uh, used these um, representations to prune away the edges by hand, and then by hand to design sequences of these, uh, in those days, not yet parallel compositions that would achieve 
uh, various behavioral properties in the real world. So um, that, that combination of ideas, the notion of compositions in the body and abstractions of the environment is where I'm going to stop. Um, the point of these compositional methods, which, uh, you know, if you take uh, my uh, ideological view as the path to programming work, the, the requirement is that any composition of basins is a formal prescription of a relationship between the basins being composed. And what Turner has been able to do is think about attractor basins, not just as having attractors, but as having dual repellers. And I'm now gonna get out of your way, Turner, and uh, uh, let you uh, tell your story yourself. All right, everybody. Uh, let me just get this started from the current slide. Um, can you hear me and can you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. All right. So as uh, Dan was just mentioning, um, so we, you know, Aaron gave us this idea of the ground reaction complex, which is really useful for kind of enumerating all the different contact modes that you might find yourself in as a robot in the world. But it has one drawback in that, you know, there's only one surface in which we're thinking about contact and the environments that we want to, you know, start to do real world tasks in have many different surfaces that we might want to interact with. So let's get rid of that single annotated, or sorry, that single surface and have N annotated substrates. And so to illustrate this, I'm going to show you this uh, experiment we ran back in 2019, uh, where we hop on top of a box. Now, in this environment, so it's still simple, but a little bit more complex than a single surface. We have, you know, the ground labeled as surface one. We have the top of the box labeled as surface two. And we have the front of the box labeled as surface three. Now, if we construct ground reaction complexes for each of those, we can start to see a, a, a you know, relationship between them that allows us to define tasks like jump on top of the ledge as start in mode one, one, both of the feet on the floor and end in mode two, two, both of the feet on the box. And we can see sort of the potential sequences at, at a high level um, that we might take to go from start to finish. And so then if in each mode where we know in each known contact mode, um, if we take a dynamics model and apply some controller, we can make uh, programmable guard conditions. And so what I mean by that here, we've got a robot in mode one, two, you know, feet on the ground, feet on the top of the box. Now we blow up that part of this graph here. You can see that there are these shaded regions around solid lines. Those are the programmed targets that we, that we made for this specific problem, uh, which has to do with the you know, parameters, these lengths involved for jumping on top of this box and we've rendered them attracting with our controller. So now uh, as time goes on, we're gonna get closer and closer to hitting these targets. And once we're near enough to them for government work, we will uh, trigger a reset into the next desired mode. And in that way, we can kind of climb up the reaction complex to our target goal. So in the end, you get something that looks like this bubble chart down here, which is, you know, each one of these things is a feedback continuous mode set of dynamics that flows towards some kind of guard condition, which we think we know the reset to. Now we are assuming that we always get to that guard condition and we're assuming that the reset is always what we expect, which we'll talk about later, um, isn't always the case, obviously, but for now it's, it's a good start, except for if you want to include a lot of different surfaces in your plan and you have a K-legged machine, you're going to have N to the K different Different nodes. And if you think about different types of friction, stick versus slip, you're going to have two end of the K nodes. And so now if you're thinking about sequences in this reaction complex, you're going to have two end of the K factorial different sequences. And this is obviously, you know, not tractable. So how do we avoid that kind of complexity when we plan in the environment here? Um, so obviously we don't want to restrict control uh, designers to thinking of less surfaces. We want N to be as big as they need it to be. And we don't want to restrict them to a single kind of friction mode. Um, but we can try to reduce the complexity of K and the factorial nature of this problem. And so enter one of our favorite tools here. Um, this is work by my, my colleague, Avik Day. Uh, he has this formal input decoupling of sagittal plane robots into a floating torso, so a body pitch, which you can control with the torque, and an input decoupled uh, pendulum-like template. And so these are input decoupled, so I can think about these systems as being separate. They don't crosstalk. Um, but I also get this uh, benefit here where I can think of arbitrary numbers of limbs being having active contacts as being a single leg. I can think about the central force that they generate from some kind of centroid of their toes or something. And that immediately is going to allow us to kind of reduce this two end of the K thing down to two end. And I'll show you a kind of an illustrative picture here where, so in the anchor in the sagittal plane version of this robot, we've got a two-legged robot swinging from a bar and we've got a two-legged uh, robot jumping off the ground. The full reaction complex for this is this nine uh, mode thing. 
But in reality, all of these modes where the robot is only touching the bar um, and nothing else can be mapped into the same template model because we don't care which leg is active or if both are active, we can do the same things. And similarly, we can do that for the robot who has a leg on the ground. Now, if you have legs on two different surfaces, your toe centroid is gonna end up somewhere in the middle of space. We're gonna call that a composed substrate and we'll talk about that later. But just know for now that we can actually kind of uh, compose some friction constraints for that invisible toe as a function of the real friction constraints at the real toes. Um, and so we can actually think about the template reaction complex as being a, a real thing through which we can navigate. So the question then becomes, if we can um, compose suitable anchor behaviors using this composition method, and um, if we can compose sequentially with the, the template, that uh, inverted pendulum over here, and if we can then compose in parallel with sequences, so if I come up with a sequence of templates of uh, inverted pendulum steps and I add to them some body pitch, some posture principle, um, then we're gonna be able to actually reduce this, uh, the complexity even further. We're gonna get rid of the factorial nature of this because we're only going to have to think about behaviors on the edges uh, rather than sequences that pass through all the nodes. So the first big if from that previous slide is, can we do anything really with this parallel composition method? Um, so if we're going to be doing template plans, we better bring along our favorites, uh, vertical hoppers and slip like things. Um, and let's add some brachiating stuff for fun since that seems interesting. And then let's add some posture principles. So, you know, a lot of times we want to keep the body pitch really steady as we move through the world to protect sensor payloads or what have you. And maybe sometimes we've got uh, more expressive uh, postures where we want to have some constant velocity that we're tracking. Well, it turns out you go ahead and start to compose these things, you end up with a lot of useful behaviors. So let's look at uh, an example one here. This is the backflip on the bottom left here. Um, so the template plan is simple, right? You just kind of jump in the air a little bit, maybe to the side, um, and you go ahead and apply a constant velocity body pitch. And the key here is you inherit the, the programmable properties of both the column of uh, body pitches and the row of templates. So I can choose the hopping height independently and program that, and I can choose the rotation rate independently. So if I do it kind of wrong here, I've chosen a high hopping height, but a slow rotation rate, you can see that I'll crash on the floor here. Um, but if I go ahead and exchange a little faster rotation rate for a slightly smaller hopping height, in fact, I'm able to get almost all the way around and complete this backflip just by composing this simply from these two parallel bits. Um, and we can do the same kinds of things with our, um, uh, brachiating behavior. So here we're putting an active constant velocity that we're tracking to allow us to reach a little further and grab a bar that's farther away. And we can do the same thing for our um, still uh, uh, body pitch, where we, um, you know, if you want, again, if you want to keep your sensor still or you need your camera pointing sort of toward the floor during this behavior, we can keep the body still as it goes through the air here and grabs a, uh, another rung of the ladder. So then finally, we want to do this kind of sequential composition, right? So if we can start to compose a brachiating thing with a slip thing with a brachiating thing, what you're going to end up with is a sequential composition in the anchor if you just apply the same pitch steady principle here um, to both of those, or all three of those pieces here. So that's where I think this gets the most exciting. And so this is what we're working towards here. And so everything you've seen so far has been what I've been calling edge open loop. And what do I mean by edge open loop? Um, when we, when we make assumptions about models, when we make assumptions about controllers that act on templates, when we do MPC, we, we assume something about our contact conditions and we monitor them sometimes, but oftentimes I, I think most of our failures in robotics come from when we just lose friction all of a sudden. And, you know, we still think that we have our foot on the ground and we do something stupid. So, you know, there are a couple of ways that we can handle this. We can write friction detectors. We can write kind of ad hoc recovery behaviors, but wouldn't it be nice to, instead of kind of doing this from, you know, slowly putting out every fire that comes up, wouldn't it be nice to have kind of a generalizable or a, a generative plan for handling these kinds of things? And so enter this idea of edge reactivity, which um, first we'll talk about at the template plan layer, but instead of having open loop, you know, sequences of states or modes here, um, let's think about just the edges as being composable themselves. So I can go from, well, not everyone to everyone, but I, if I'm in a particular mode, I can look at the look at this as a host diagram, which then says that there are a bunch of edges that are available to me. And then I can just kind of go up the ladder slowly by finding the available host diagrams. And I can do this until either I succeed or I can do this until, um, you know, I, I failed so, so thoroughly that there's no recovering, uh, at least within this context. 
And so what uh, gets interesting about this is if you go ahead and push this forward to the anchor, you get some of the same thing. So the anchor is going to be doing the mode detection. It's going to be the thing that's always checking to see if its feet are stuck on the ground or not. But then it's going to be able to take that information and figure out what, what should I do within the context of this, of this reaction complex to solve the task. So this is all a little abstract. So I'm going to show this with a video here. Um, so this task is just jump across the gap. And so right now I have uh, the robot just simply doing the, the dumbest way you could do this, jump up in the air and land on both feet. So that's, that's uh, if you look at the top left, that's the template plan. And then there's an arrow pointing to the synthesized plan where it remains pitch steady. Okay, but that's open, uh, you know, edge open loop again. What happens if I nefariously put a banana peel under its front legs? Well, it doesn't know that it slips here. And so it thinks it's generating a lot more lateral forces. And it's also generating a torque around the body that it didn't expect. And so what results is we land on our face in the middle of the gap and we fail pretty, pretty thoroughly. Um, so what if we were being a little bit more edge reactive and right here realize, oh, I'm no longer in the contact mode I think I'm in. What should I do? What is the available edge? Well, it goes ahead and sees, actually, there's a synthesized plan with an orange available edge right here that I can just start following. And this will help me, you know, I can do this now middle plan on the bottom row that allows me to do this uh, handspring leap over the gap and recover from that same slip that in the open loop way fell into the gap. And even better, and so this is where we're really trying to push, is what if you slip not only once, but twice here. And so right here, as it goes to push away, it realizes, oh no, I, I didn't get enough uh, traction. And so now I'm just falling. So it turns back to the anchor and the anchor says, look, you're really close to mode two one. Why don't you just put both your legs down and then I'll pass this information back up to the template planner. The template planner says, hmm, mode two one, that's this composed substrate three. Let me make you a new plan, but it's a simple plan because it's in the template space. And then we can resynthesize a recovery, which is what happens here. And we're almost able to jump out of that, out of that gap here, but it doesn't quite make it. But. So that, that's the big takeaway uh, from this talk, which is if you can do the planning in the template space, and then you can quickly synthesize these anchor plans, you're going to be very, very robust to things like loss of traction. Um, and that's, that's the direction that we're really trying to go with these research. So uh, with that, I will, uh, you know, uh, quick thank you to our sponsors and I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Dan and the moderators for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Let's see if we have questions. I do have a question. It's more of something that I couldn't understand. So again, could you, could you elaborate more on the planner between the templates? So on based on what do you decide what kind of template should be used in the sequence between that? Right. So um, basically, because we have these kind of uh, so if I, I should probably reshare the screen, but basically, if you looked at that palette of behaviors, um, there is, you know, a, a row of available templates um, that determines what all the anchor behaviors that we can synthesize are. And so I'll just click it really quick, right? Yeah. So if you look at this diagram here, so basically, if you have controllers here that you know how to compose and sequence, and so we know how to do some of this stuff, right? Uh, there, there's a paper by uh, Ulrich Soranli and uh, Omar Amur, uh, Arslan that talks about composing slip, for instance, to jump to different surfaces in the world. If we know how to compose these in sequence, then we're going to be able to compose anchor behaviors that are more complex that live on top of them. Does that make sense? Or uh, should, I try, <laughs> should I try again? No, no, no. Uh, yeah, I do understand that. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see if there are other, I don't think there are other questions from that. Um, but truly, thank you so much for, uh, for the presentation. Actually, I think this is one of the, 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 the talks that are actually are a bit um, different from most of the talks that we can see. So I, I, I truly do like that. Um, the opportunity. No worries. So this